And other astronomers either say there was a primordial explosion, an enormous bang millions of years ago, billions of years ago, which flung all the galaxies into space. Well, let's take that argument and say that was the way it happened. It's like uh, you took a bottle of ink and you threw it at a wall. Smash, and all that ink spreads. And in the middle, it's dense, isn't it? And as it gets out on the edge, the little droplets are finer and finer and make more complicated patterns. See? So in the same way, there was a big bang in the beginning of things and it spread. And you and I, sitting here in this room, as complicated human beings, are way, way out on the fringe of that bang. We are the complicated little patterns on the end of it. Very interesting. But so we define ourselves as being only that. If you think that you are only inside your skin, you define yourself as one very complicated little curly cue, way out on the edge of that explosion, way out in space and way out in time. Billions of years ago, you were a big bang. But now you're a complicated human being. And when then we cut ourselves off <coughs> like this and don't feel that we are still the big bang. But you are. Depends how you define yourself. You are actually, if, if this is the way things started, if there was a Big Bang in the beginning, you're not something that is a result of the Big Bang on the end of the process. You are still the process. You are the Big Bang, the original force of the universe coming on as whoever you are. See, when I meet you, I see not just you, what you define yourself as, Mr. So-and-so, Miss So-and-so, Mrs. So-and-so. I see every one of you as the primordial energy of the universe coming on at me in this particular way. I know I'm that too. But we've learned to define ourselves as separate from it. And so what I would call a kind of a basic problem we've got to go through first is to understand that there are no such things as things. That is to say, separate things or separate events. That that is only a way of talking. And if you can understand this, you're going to have no further problems. <laughs> I once asked a group of high school children, what do you mean by a thing? And first of all, they gave me all sorts of synonyms. They said, it's an object which is simply another word for a thing. It doesn't tell you anything about what you mean by a thing. And finally, a very smart girl from Italy who was in the group said a thing is a noun. And she was quite right. A noun isn't a part of nature, it's part of speech. There are no nouns in the physical world. There are no separate things in the physical world either. See, the physical world is wiggly. The clouds, mountains, trees, people are all wiggly. And uh, only when human beings get working at things, they build buildings in straight lines and try and make out that the world isn't really wiggly. But here are we sitting in this room all built on straight lines, but each one of us is as wiggly as all get out. Now then, when you uh, want to get control of something that wiggles, it's pretty difficult, isn't it? You try and pick up a fish in your hands and the fish is wiggly and it slips out. What do you do to get hold of the fish? You use a net. And so the, the net is the basic thing we have for getting hold of the wiggly world. And so if you want to get hold of this wiggle, you've got to put a net over it. And I can number the holes in a net. So many so holes up, so many holes across. And if I can number these holes, I can count exactly where each wiggle is in terms of a hole in that net. And that's the beginning of calculus, the art of measuring the world. But in order to do that, I've got to break up the wiggle into bits. And I've got to call this a specific bit, and this the next bit of the wiggle, and this the next bit, and this the next bit of the wiggle. And so these bits are things or events bits of wiggles. 
which I mark out in order to talk about the wiggle, in order to measure it, and therefore in order to control it. But in nature, in fact, in the physical world, the wiggle isn't bitted. Like you don't get a cut up fryer out of an egg. But you have to cut the chicken up in order to eat it. You bite it, but it doesn't come bitten. So the world doesn't come thing, it doesn't come invented. You and I are all as much continuous with the physical universe as a wave is continuous with the ocean. The ocean waves and the universe people. And as the wave, I wave at you and say, you, the world is waving at me with you and saying, uh, hi, I'm here. But we are consciousness the way we feel and sense our existence being based on a myth that we are made that we are parts that we are things our consciousness has been influenced so that each one of us does not feel that we feel we have been hypnotized literally hypnotized by social convention into feeling and sensing that we exist only inside our skins that we are not the original bang but just something out on the end of it. And therefore we are scared stiff. Because my wave is going to disappear. And I'm going to die. And that would be awful. We've got a mythology going now, which as uh, Father Maskell put it, we are nothing but something that happens between the maternity ward and the crematorium. And that's it. And therefore everybody feels unhappy and miserable. No. This is what people really believe today. You may go to church, you may say you believe in this, that, and the other, but you don't. Even Jehovah's Witnesses, who are the most fundamentalist fundamentalists, they're polite when they come round and knock at the door. But if you really believed in Christianity, you'd be screaming in the streets. But nobody does. You'd be taking full-page ads in the paper every day. You'd have the most terrifying television programs. The churches would be going out of their minds if they really believe what they teach, but they don't. They think they ought to believe what they teach. They believe they should believe, but they don't believe it, because what we really believe is the fully automatic model. And that is our basic plausible common sense. I was discussing an alternative myth to the ceramic and fully automatic models universe. I'll call the dramatic myth. The idea that life as we experience it's a big act and that behind this big act is the player and uh, the player or the self as it's called in Hindu philosophy, the Atman, is you. Only you are playing hide-and-seek, since that is the essential game that's going on. It's the game of games, the basis of all games, hide-and-seek. And so since you're playing hide-and-seek, you are deliberately, although you can't admit this, or won't admit it, you are deliberately forgetting who you really are, or what you really are, and the knowledge that your essential self is the foundation of the universe, the ground of being, as Tillich calls it, is something you have as what the Germans call a Hintergedanke. A Hintergedanke is a thought way, way, way in the back of your mind, way back here somewhere. Something that you know deep down, but uh, can't admit. So, in a way then, in, in order to bring this to the front, in order to know that that is the case, you have to be kitted out of your game. You see, the problem is this. We identify in our experience a differentiation between what we do and what happens to us. We have a certain number of actions that we define as voluntary. 
we feel in control of those. And then over against that, there is uh, all those things that are involuntary. But the dividing line between these two is very arbitrary. Because, for example, when you uh, move your hand, you feel that you decide whether to open it or to close it. But then ask yourself, how do you decide? When you decide to open your hand, do you first decide to decide? You don't, do you? You just decide, and how do you do that? And if you don't know how you do it, is it voluntary or involuntary? Let's consider breathing. You can feel that you breathe deliberately. You can control your breath. But when you don't think about it, it goes on. Is it voluntary or involuntary? So we come to have a very arbitrary definition of self. That much of my activity, which I feel I do. And that then doesn't include breathing most of the time. It doesn't include the heartbeats. It doesn't include uh, the activity of the glands. It doesn't include digestion. It doesn't include how you shape your bones, circulate your blood. Do you or do you not do these things? Now, if you get with yourself and you find out that you are all of yourself, a very strange thing happens. You find that your body knows that you are one with the universe. In other words, that the so-called involuntary circulation of your blood is one continuous process with the stars shining. If you find out that it's you who circulates your blood, you will at the same moment find out that you are shining the sun. Because your physical eye to work towards a definition of omnipotence. Omnipotence is not knowing how everything is done. It's just doing it. You don't have to translate it into language. Look, supposing when you got up in the morning, you had to switch your brain on and you had to think and do as a deliberate process waking up all the circuits that you need for active life during the day why you'd never get done because you have to do all those things at once how can a centipede control a hundred legs at once because it doesn't think about it and so in the same way you are unconsciously performing all the various activities of your organism only unconsciously isn't a good word because it sounds sort of dead. Superconsciously would be better. Give it a plus rather than a minus. Because what a consciousness is, is simply a sort of specialized form of awareness. When you uh, look around the room, you are conscious of as much as you can notice. And you see an enormous number of things which you don't notice. If, for example, I look at a girl here and somebody asks me later, what was she wearing? I may not know, although I've seen, because I didn't attend. But I was aware, you see. And perhaps if I could, uh, under hypnosis, be asked this question, where I would get my conscious attention out of the way be through being in the hypnotic state, I could recall what dress she was wearing. So then, just in the same way as you don't focus your attention on how you make your thyroid gland function, so in the same way you don't have any attention focused on how you shine the sun. Another way of talking about the web is that there are different levels of magnification. For example, supposing you take a piece of embroidery, and here it is, obviously in front of you, an ordered and beautiful object. Then you take out a microscope, and you look at the individual threads. At a certain point, as you turn up the microscope, you'll get a hopeless tangle, which doesn't make any sense at all. The wrapped fiber, 
constitutes the thread is a mess. It hasn't been organized, nobody did anything about it. But at the level of magnification at which you actually see it with the naked eye, it's all been organized. All right, now keep turning up that microscope. Take one of those individual threads in the fiber that seems to be so chaotic and go into the constitution of that. And again, you'll find fantastic order. You'll find the most gorgeous designs of uh, molecules. Then to keep turning it up. And again, at a certain level, you'll find chaos again. All right, keep going. And at another level, you'll find this marvelous order. Now you see, order and randomness constitute, in other words, the warp and the woof. Where everything is in order, everything's under control. In randomness, it's all, all it's a mess. But we wouldn't know what order was unless we had messes. It's the contrast of order and messes that order itself depends upon. And so in this exactly the same way, it is the contrast of on and off, there and not there, in other words, life and death, being and non-being, that constitutes existence. Only we pretend that the random side of things, the disorderly side of things, could possibly win in the game of competition, or I would rather call it collaboration between the two. When you lose sight of the fact that the order principle and the random principle go together, that's exactly the same predicament as losing sight of the fact that all individually delineated things and beings are connected underneath. You know, just like mountains stick out of the earth and there's a fundamental earth underneath them. So all of us as different things, we stick out of reality and there's a continuity underneath, but you ignore that, you see. That's the thing that's left out. See, I'm just giving you many examples of the same principle. But really, deep down, we are, each one of us, everything that there is doing it this way, and then again that way, and then again another way, and that's what it keeps up doing forever and ever. Only, it has holidays, which are called deaths. You know in the story of the creation of the world in the Bible, God works for seven days and rests the seventh. It's necessary to have a holiday. Holiday is holy day. And uh, the Sabbath, for the Jews is Saturday, for the Christians is Sunday, because Saturday is the last day of the week, but Sunday is the first day of the week. And it's a slight difference of alteration between a Jewish temperament and a Christian temperament. Some people like to take the holiday and then do the work. Other people like to do the work and then take the holiday. <laughs> and since the Jews do the work first and then take the holiday, they're always a little up on the Christians in business. <laughs> but the point is that a holiday, this pause between something going on, is of the essence of the idea of a web. For example, there's an Irish, famous Irishman who's supposed to have described a net as a lot of holes tied together with string. <laughs> so the holes are very, very important. And uh, these are the holy days. You see the holes. This all goes together. <laughs> so there must be that interval and it exists on all kinds of levels it isn't simply that there is for example a sound that is sounded is a vibration and the sound goes on and off there, every everything that we call sound is sound silence there is no such thing as pure sound you couldn't hear it 
What you hear is that tap, 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 tap against the eardrum. But it happens very fast, so that you get more of an impression of sound than you do of silence. But between every little undulation of sound, there is also an interval. When you listen to music, you hear a melody. But what you hear, actually, that makes the melody significant are the steps between the tones, what we call the intervals. And a person who doesn't hear intervals is tone deaf. He only hears noises. He doesn't hear the steps. So that interval between whatever happens is as important as what happens. So we'll call these two things, the sound and the silence, the life and the death, somewhat analogous in weaving to the warp and the woof. Now, look at the marvelous way in which warp and woof go together. A piece of cloth is an extraordinary thing when you consider it's made of a line of string. There's something uh, that always struck me as a child. Fabulous. That string, just thread, could turn into cloth. Why should it hang together? How improbable. Now, summing up, we've discussed the web from three points of view. As an analogy of the selective operation of our senses and mind, whereby certain things in the world are picked out as significant according to certain game rules. The game that we are playing mostly is the survival game. That is to say, the game ought to go on. Only, the way we play the survival game has a, a kind of element in it which makes it difficult because we tend to say the first rule of this game is that it's serious. And that messes the whole thing up. So you have to watch out, in other words, when you play for contradictory game rules, self-contradictory game rules, because if you get mixed up into them, the game ceases to be worth the candle. You start straining at doing something, then it just isn't worth it. Then the second thing that we observed was the web as an analogy of mutual interdependence. We could call it the idea that all existence is relative, that all existence is transactional. The transaction being typically exemplified by, say, the operation of buying and selling, in which there can be no buying without somebody selling and there can be no selling without somebody else buying. That kind of interdependence of the inside going together with the outside what is in you going together with what is outside you is absolutely fundamental to existence. It is existence. Existence is relativity. Then, we explored the web as a trap. The spider's web. Won't you come into my parlor, said the spider to the fly. And we saw what happens if you look at all of life from the point of view that it is original selfishness and original hunger. And we found that if you take that point of view to its ultimate extreme, it dissolves. And it isn't so bad after all. There's a famous comment that R. H. Blythe made on the passage in Macbeth, where Shakespeare says, it is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. And Blythe says, when it's put that way, it doesn't seem so bad after all. <laughs> because twas brillig and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wave. And that's, uh, that's Zen. I had a discussion with a great master in Japan on the last visit there. And uh, we were talking about the various people who are working to translate the Zen books 
into English. And uh, he said, that's a waste of time. If you really understand Zen, he said, you can use any book. You could use the Bible. You could use Alice in Wonderland. You could use the dictionary. Because, he said, the sound of the rain needs no translation. So what does the rain say? Evening rain. It is the banana leaf that speaks of it first. You see, that's the point. And all the talk in the world doesn't get it unless you listen to the talk in a new way. The sound of the rain needs no translation. So you see, there's something going on, this web may be looked at as, a, as pattern. And the world is basically patterning. What else do you do when you come to think of it? When you eat, you uh, are turning food into the pattern of your skeleton, your muscles, and your nervous system. That's a pattern. And you say, you see, basically, hooray for that pattern. That's great, it's terribly interesting. But then you want other patterns. You like to look through a microscope and see the patterns that exist in the small world. You like to look through a kaleidoscope or a telidoscope and see the patterns. You like to have paintings around and see the patterns. You like to watch the water play. You want to watch the birds go, or the clouds, and all that. Fascinating patterns. And that really does, doesn't it, seem to be the point. I mean, what do you do when you're very rich and you want, uh, let's take some rascal of ancient times who became very rich by all sorts of skullduggery and uh, warfare and so on. He got himself a suit of armor beautiful sword and he had the armorer make the most intricate patterns arabesques of inlaid gold on the steel why because it's as they say among the Pennsylvania Dutch it's for nice <laughs> it's a great thing to have all that jazz and that's what we go for so you have this process which is quite spontaneous, going on. We call it life. It's controlling itself. It's aware of itself. It's aware of itself through you. You are an aperture through which the universe looks at itself. And because of it's the universe looking at itself through you, there's always an aspect of itself that it can't see. So it's just like that snake, you see, that is pursuing its tail because the snake can't see its head, like you can't. We always find, as we investigate the universe, make the microscope bigger and bigger, and we will find ever more minute things. Make the telescope bigger and bigger and bigger, and the universe expands, because it's running away from itself. It won't do that if you don't chase it. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's a game of hide and seek. Really, when you ask the question, who is doing the chasing, you are still working under the assumption that every verb has to have a subject that when there is an action, there has to be a doer. Well, that's a, what I would call a grammatical convention, leading to what Whitehead called the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. Like the famous it in It Is Raining. So when you say, there cannot be knowing without a knower, 
This is merely saying no more than there can't be a verb without a subject. And that's a grammatical rule and not a law of nature. Anything you can think of as a thing, as a noun, can be described by a verb. And there are languages which do that. It sounds awkward in English, but face it. When you look for doers as distinct from deeds, you can't find them. Just as when you look for stuff underlying the patterns of nature, you can't find any stuff. You just find more and more patterns. There never was any stuff. It's a ghost. What we call stuff is simply patterns seen out of focus. And it's fuzzy. So we call it stuff. <laughs> it's, you know, it's like K-pop. <laughs> so, we, you know, we have these words, energy, matter, being, reality, even Tao. And we can never find them. They always elude us entirely. Although we do have the very strong intuition that all this that we see is connected or related. So we speak of a universe. Although that word really means one term. It's your turn now. <laughs> Or like you make one turn to look at yourself. But you can't make two turns and see what's looking. <laughs> so, it's very simple, therefore. You only have to understand that you can't do anything about it. And as they say in Zen, you cannot take hold of it, but you can't get rid of it. And in not being able to get it, you get it. So all these trials that gurus put their students through have as their ultimate object convincing you that you can't do anything. Only it's convincing you very thoroughly. It's convincing you in more than a theoretical way. Now perhaps I shouldn't tell you that. But you see, I'm not a guru in that I don't give individual spiritual direction to people. And I give away the guru's tricks. That may not be very good, but on the other hand, those tricks are only necessary in the sense that I would say to someone, it's necessary for you to go to a psychiatrist if you think you must. And if you are not going to be satisfied without going to Japan and studying Zen Buddhism from a Roshi, okay, you better go. It isn't necessary unless you say it is. If that's the only thing that will satisfy you, and you feel that deep down inside you. If you've got that yen, therefore you've got that yen. But if on the other hand you haven't, you haven't. And I'm not going to put you down on that account, you see. The point is, what do you want to do? What is it in you to do? But there it is, that you can struggle and struggle and struggle, and indeed will do so, as long as you have the feeling inside you that you're missing something. And people, your friends, all sorts of people will do their utmost to persuade you that you're missing something. <laughs> because they're missing something, and they think they're getting it through a certain way. And therefore, to assure themselves, they'd like you to do it too. So there's this thing. And you see, a clever guru beguiles his students by letting them have the feeling of success and accomplishment in certain directions. A guru gives people exercises, A, that are difficult but can be accomplished, and B, that are impossible. 
You'll always be hung up on the impossible ones, but the possible ones you will feel, get a feeling of making progress so that you will double your efforts to solve the impossible exercises. And then they range things in many, many ranks and levels through which you can advance. This state of consciousness, that state of consciousness, or think of the degrees of masonry, or so on. Ranks in learning things, the different belts you get in judo and all that kind of jazz. You can do that. And it gives people the sense of competing with themselves or even with others. Because of the feeling inside that there is just something I'm missing. And of course, if you are learning any sort of skill and you haven't perfected the skill, there is indeed something you're missing. But in this thing that we're talking about, that isn't true. Because you, as the Buddhists say, are Buddhas from the very beginning. And all that searching is like looking for your own head, which you can't see and therefore might conceivably imagine that you're lost. So, that indeed is the point, that we don't see what looks, and therefore we think we've lost it. And so we're in search of the self, the Atman. Well, that's the one thing we can't find. <laughs> because we have it. We are it. <laughs> but we confuse it with all these images. There was a joke in Punch some time ago, many years ago, I remember, of, a, of an army doctor interviewing a private. And the private says, every time I shake my leg like this, it hurts. He said, God damn it, don't shake it. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, when one has something that hurts, there's a subtle temptation to keep worrying it. Like if you have a filling out of a tooth, your tongue plays with the empty hole. And children, will experiment with pain in this way. It's like a dare. Children are always playing the game of daring each other to do something forbidden. Because the risk of disapproval involved, the calamity that may follow from it, it makes it so exciting. And why on earth do people challenge disaster the way they do? doing all sorts of wildly adventurous things. Because obviously that gives a taste, a quality to a vibration that is extremely interesting. Why the craving for speed? So. And it's only if you look very carefully at a vibration that you can see this point. That's why meditative exercises often involve a repetition process. Om, or saying a phrase, or doing an act like a mudra, over and over and over again. After a while it becomes meaningless. You can say your own name like the Sufis do and go on and on and on and on and on and finally it doesn't mean anything at all it's just a noise but it isn't just a noise you see the attitude of saying that something is just a noise or just a, a wiggle is an adult attitude no wiggle to the child is just a wiggle to the child the elemental thing going on is bleh. You know, I mean, it's just fantastic. <laughs> now, do you see why this is what mystics call ineffable? That is to say, you can't really talk about it. When I try to explain what I mean by digging a sound,
I suddenly realize that I'm not really saying anything. And yet there are states of consciousness in which you can listen to sound and realize that that is the whole point of being alive. Just to go with this particular energy manifestation that is happening right at this moment. To be it. The whole world is the energy playing at doing all this. See, like a kaleidoscope, jazzing. So if you watch that, and watch it that way, you will be accused, of course, by those who are guardians of the game of doing something very dangerous. So you're going completely crazy. I mean, the number of theological texts I've read which express in one way or another this horror of everything becoming meaningless, meaningless life, a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury. Those people, you see, have not dared to look at it. Now there's another way of looking at it, of course. Where in states of acute depression, people see it all as meaningless, but not really meaningless. They see it all as a conspiracy of horror. Let's imagine that everything is mechanical. There are no living beings at all. There are a lot of beings that are such good computers that you can't tell the difference between them and what you thought were people. <laughs> but everything going on is simply clockwork. And uh, there's nobody home, although it puts on a convincing show that there is. So you get the feeling that the entire world is enameled tin or patent leather or plastic and tasteless, hollow, vulgar, like a Wurlitzer jukebox. That's a very common feeling of people who get into acute depression. But you see there is still here evaluation. You are associating the world with the mechanical as distinct from the organic. And we have a tendency, you see, to put down the mechanical because obviously a plastic flower doesn't have the scent, doesn't have the soft feeling of a living flower. Oh, there will be a few plastic flowers, but it, you know what it'll do. It'll smell vaguely like soap and it won't smell like a flower. So it'll be plastic smell. Now we know that, you see, and so we contrast it with the organic. So, here is this extraordinary phenomenon. Now let me say, having presented you with all these fireworks, let me say a few sober things about Zen as a historical phenomenon. Zen is a subdivision of Mahayana Buddhism. And as you know, that is the school of Buddhism, which is concerned with realizing Buddha nature in this world. Not necessarily by going off to the mountains or by renouncing family life, everyday life, etc., etc., as if that were an entanglement, but realizing in the midst of life the possibility of becoming a Buddha. And uh, so, the great ideal personality of Mahayana Buddhism is the Bodhisattva, a word now applied 
to somebody who has attained nirvana, but instead of disappearing, comes back in many, many guises. There's a famous painting of one of the bodhisattvas in the form of a prostitute. And bodhisattvas in Zen art are often represented as bums. There's the beautiful one over there, painted by Sengai, of the bum Pote, or Putai in Chinese, who's always immensely fat. And he's saying, Buddha is dead. Maitreya, who is supposed to be the next Buddha, hasn't come yet. I had a wonderful sleep, and didn't even dream about Confucius. And he's just stretching and yawning as he wakes up. So, Zen is Mahayana, Indian Mahayana Buddhism, translated into Chinese and therefore deeply influenced by Taoism and Confucianism. Zen monks brought Confucian ideas to Japan. And the origins of Zen lie actually around the year 414, at which time a great Hindu scholar by the name of Kumara Jiva was translating with a group of assistants the Buddhist sutras into Chinese. One of his students taught that all beings whatsoever have the capacity to become Buddha, to become enlightened. Even rocks and stones. And that even heretics and evil doers have the Buddha nature or Buddha potentiality in them. And everybody said he was a dreadful heretic. But then a text called the Nirvana Sutra came from India, which said precisely that. So everybody had to admit that this man was right. He also began to teach that awakening must be instantaneous. It's a kind of all or nothing state. I don't mean that there aren't degrees of its intensity, but once you see the principle, you see the whole thing. As they say, when the bottom falls out of the bucket, all the water goes together. Those men then promulgated the way of sudden awakening. Bodhidharma came later, and he is supposed in legend to have been followed by a line of six patriarchs, of which he was the first. The second was named Eka, I'm using the Japanese pronunciation, who was formerly a general of the army. Then the third was Sosan, who wrote the Shinjin Mei, which is the most marvelous little summary of Buddhism in verse. And so on till they came to Eno, the sixth patriarch. You know perhaps more familiarly his Chinese name, Huinang. He died in 715 AD. He's the real founder of Chinese Zen. The man who synthesized the whole thing and was the at least his collected discourses are contained in what is called the Platform Sutra. And any student of Zen should read the Platform Sutra. But Eno really fused Zen with the Chinese way of doing things. And he emphasized very thoroughly, do not think you are going to attain Buddhahood by sitting down all day and keeping your mind blank. Because a lot of those students who practiced jhana, which is the Sanskrit for chan, which is the Chinese for zen, which is in turn Japanese, means meditation, or contemplation perhaps would be a better translation in English. And everybody thought that the proper way to contemplate was to be as still as possible. But according to Zen, that is to be a stone Buddha instead of a living Buddha. Now I can knock a stone Buddha on the head, clunk, 
and it has no feelings. And so it's a stone Buddha. There was a famous Zen master called Tanka, who went to a little lonely temple on a freezing cold night. And he took the Buddha image, one of the Buddha images off the altar, split it up and made a fire. And when the attendant of the temple came in in the morning, he was horrified. He broke at the image and Tanka took his stick, started raking in the ashes. And the temple priest said, what are you looking for? He said, I'm looking for the Sali, that is to say the jewels that are supposed to be found in the body of a genuine Buddha when he's cremated. So the priest said, you couldn't expect to find Sali from a wooden Buddha. In that case, said Tanko, let me have that other Buddha for my fire. <laughs> <coughs> That's, you see, the difference between living Buddha and stone Buddha. But a person who thinks that in order to be awakened, you have to be heartless, to have no emotions, no feelings, that you couldn't possibly lose your temper or get angry or feel annoyed or depressed. Those people haven't got the right idea at all. If that's your ideal, said Eno, you might just as well be a block of wood or a piece of stone. What he wanted you to understand is that your real mind while all those emotions are going on, is imperturbable. Just like when you move your hand through the sky, you don't leave a track. The birds don't stain the blue when they pass by. And when the water reflects the image of the geese, the reflection doesn't stick there. So to be pure-minded in the Zen way, or clear-minded is a better way of translating it, is not to have no thoughts, it's not a question of not thinking about dirty things. One great master of the Tang Dynasty, when asked, what is Buddha? Believe it or not, answered, a dried turd. So it's not that kind of purity. It is purity, clarity, in the sense that your mind isn't sticky. You don't harbor grievances. You don't be attached to the past. You go with it, with life. Life is flowing all the time. That is the Tao, the flow of life. You are going along with it whether you want to or not. You're like people in a stream. You can swim against the stream, but you'll still be moved along by it. And all you'll do is wear yourself out in futility. But if you swim with the stream, the whole strength of the stream is yours. Of course, the difficulty that so many of us have is finding out which way the stream is going. But suddenly, as it goes, all the past vanishes. The future has not yet arrived. And there is only one place to be, which is here and now. And there is no way of being anywhere else, none whatever. If you understand that thoroughly, your task is finished. You then become instantaneous and also momentous. So you must remember the aspect of Oroshi to this young monk. He's a formidable fellow, usually an older man who has about him something that is difficult to put your finger on. There's a certain fierceness coupled with a kind of tremendous directness, a sense of somebody who sees right through you. And so he really poses to this young fellow, what do you want? Why did you come here? But he said, I came to be instructed in Zen. The teacher says, well, we don't teach anything here. There isn't anything in Zen to study. Well, the student knows, or thinks he knows, that this, not anything which is studied in Zen, is the real thing. That's, of course, as a Buddhist, he knows that what isn't anything 
is the is the universe, the great void, the shunyata. And so he isn't phased by that. He says, well, nevertheless, you do have people who are working here and meditating under your instruction, and I'd like to join them. Well, maybe, but strictly on probation. Then, of course, all the details are taken. And he pays a ridiculously small fee, in modern Japan at any rate, to be able to stay in the monastery. It's very, very inexpensive. Now the teacher comes back and says, now you want to study Zen. Why? Well, because I'm oppressed by the rounds of birth and death, in other words, by the vicious circles of life in which I find myself, by suffering, by pain, and so on, and I want to be emancipated. The teacher says, who is it that wants to be emancipated? Well, that's a stopper. There was a, a good old story about one of these preliminary interviews. The master asks, first of all, very casual questions. Where's your hometown? What's your name? What did your father do? And uh, where did you go to college? Why is my hand so much like the Buddha's hand? And suddenly, you know, in midstream of an ordinary conversation, clunk, the student is blocked. And so there is devised the koan, K-O-A-N in Chinese, kung han. And this means, literally, the word koan means a case, in exactly the same sense as we talk about a case in law which functions as a precedent for future cases. Koan should be translated case. The koans are based on stories, mondo, of the conversations between the old masters and their students. But you can make a koan immediately by such a question, why is my hand so much like the Buddha's hand? Or, who are you that ask this question? If the student tries to verbalize on that and say, well, I am so-and-so, he asks, who knows that you're so-and-so? How do you know that you know? Who knows that you know? Find out. In other words, the basic koan is always, who are you? Who is it that wants to escape from birth and death? And I won't take words for an answer. I want to see you. And all you're showing me at the moment is your mask. So then the student is sent back to the monk's quarters, the Soto. And the chief of the, the Soto is called the Jikijitsu. He is uh, then put in charge of him. And he teaches him how to behave, what the rules are, how to eat, and how to meditate. In the Zen sect, they sit on padded cushion, uh, about the thickness of the San Francisco telephone directory, which is an admirable substitute. And then, with crossed legs in the lotus posture, with the feet resting on the thighs, uh, like you always see a Buddha, they sit for half-hour periods. That's supposed to be the length of time it takes for a stick of incense to burn. And then, uh, uh, when wooden clappers are knocked together, they all get up, and they walk round and round the room, quite fast, at a kind of bum, 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 pace. And this keeps you awake. Then, at a given signal, they go back and meditate again. And constantly there is a monk, one on each side, who carries a long, flat stick, shaped almost like this fan, in the sense that it's uh, thin at one end. And rounded at the other. And if this guy sees a monk who is slouching or sleeping or goofing off in some way, he very respectfully bows before him and the monk rests his head on his knees and this fellow takes the stick and hits him vigorously on the shoulders. Here, like this. 
Now, most apologists for Zen say, this is not punishment, it's simply to keep you awake. Don't you believe it? I've investigated this. And uh, it's, it, it's, it's the same as the, as the sort of um, British boys' school, uh, only it, isn't, it doesn't have the erotic qualities that the, the British floggings uh, do. Zen people are cool about it. But it is a kind of a fierce thing. Anyway, the uh, point of the meditation, the Zazen, is that perhaps at the beginning one does nothing more than count your breathing. So many breaths in t counting in tens. Just to allow your thoughts to become still. Zen people do not close their eyes when they meditate, nor do they close their ears. They keep their eyes on the floor in front of them. And they don't try to force away any sounds that are going on, or any smell, or any sensation, whatever. Only they don't think about it. And this can become an extraordinarily pleasant occupation. All the little sounds of distant traffic, of uh, birds, of somebody carpentering somewhere and a hammer going, dog barking, or especially rain on the roof. Gorgeous. They don't block that out. But as time goes on, instead of counting breathing, they devote themselves to the koan problem, which the Roshi has assigned. What is the sound of one hand? Who were you before your father and mother conceived you? When Joshu was asked, does a dog have Buddha nature? He replied, no. What is the meaning of no or move? All sorts of these problems. So when the, the Hindu and Buddhist philosophers speak of detachment from all this apparent world of separate beings, detachment means going with this whole thing and not resisting its change. And you can afford to go with it. You can afford to get mixed up in life. And, for, and you can afford to go with it. You can afford to get mixed up in life and to fall in love and to get involved with all sorts of things. You can afford it if you know that it's an illusion. But this is not illusion in a bad sense of the word. Here's this Hindu word, crucial. The world is called Maya. This word Maya, yes, it means illusion. It means magic, it means art, it means delineation or measurement. And so from matra we get meter, and we also get matter, material. Isn't it funny that when we say material, today we mean something very real, whereas the root of the word is illusion. <laughs> so you see, I mean measurement is kind of an illusion, you don't find inches lying around. <laughs> you can't pick up an inch. <laughs> so in, in the same way that hours and inches and pounds and uh, dollars and so on are actually imaginary. <coughs> They're uh, elaborate systems of cosmic bookkeeping with their little scratches on paper, little hairlines on dials. So in exactly that way, the distinction between things is maya, is imaginary. But what an imagination! In a way, to say that the world is maya is at the same time to say that what lies behind maya is immaterial. Look at the reversal of the word. Oh, it's immaterial. Doesn't matter. <laughs> what matters? 
go like this. But that gets us to a deeper point yet. The, the self, the real self, doesn't matter. Which is another way of saying, it doesn't exist for any purpose. It doesn't need to exist for any purpose. What purpose would it exist for? When it's what there is. It doesn't need, it won't find anything in the future. Has nothing in the past that it has to go back and remember. Is now, an eternal now. And so in that way, it doesn't matter. But therefore, the most important thing in the universe is the one thing that doesn't matter, the one thing that's totally and completely useless and that nobody can find anything for. Once a Zen master was asked, what is the most valuable thing in the world? And he answered, the head of a dead cat. Why? Because no one can put a price on it. So this self, the Brahman, is like the head of a dead cat. But you see, if then you say, hmm, I uh, really ought to get that dead cat's head because um, something spiritual about it and uh, it'd be very good for me. After all, if I, if I knew the self, I might be a better person. People might like me more. I'd be more constructive in society. I would uh, do this, that and the other. But you see, that's putting the cart before the horse. That's trying to make the tail wag the dog. The knowledge of Brahman, the self, never does anybody any good if they're trying to make it do them some good. Only when they're not concerned with whether it does them any good or not, does it do them any good. It's like when you relax and you go out and play. Americans in particular don't know how to do this because they're always justified. They always say it's good for me, it's exercise. It is to change from work and that'll be able to make me work better. See, everything they do is done for some serious reason. It's the Protestant conscience. And so we never play, except very exceptional, because play is that which is done just for itself, for fun. So the self, the Atman, the Brahman, exists for fun. It has no reason to exist. It's completely useless. And uh, it is, therefore, Maya is linked with the word Lila. And that means play. Also, of course, the word illusion in English is derived from the Latin ludere, to play. So the nature, you might say, of the self is that it does no work. It only plays. Work is something serious, you know, that you do for a purpose because you believe that you've got to go on living. You work to survive because you think you have to survive. That was one of the things they told you as a little <coughs> child. You've got to go on, man. But you don't have to. <laughs> this thing doesn't have to go on. That's why it does. I know that sounds paradoxical, but uh, there's so many things in life that are like that. If I'm trying to impress people, I usually don't. If you try too hard with anything, you usually make a mess of it. And so this basic thing then is that the self, the Brahman behind the world, is engaged in play. This, it is in this sense that the Hindu philosophers say Brahman does not actually become the world. The meaning of that is he's playing at being it, or it's playing at being it, as distinct from working at it. And so in certain oriental countries, when one refers to noble people of high birth, it is often said, uh, so, so, Lord, so-and-so has died. The Japanese would say, he has played at dying. Or will he 
play at taking a journey to Tokyo. <laughs> also, remember this, although I've constantly used in this talk the word one to apply to the self and central. The Hindus don't use this word except speaking poetically and loosely. The self is not one. The self is called non-dual. Because you see, the idea of one has an opposite. The opposite of one is many, or none. But the which than which there is no witcher has no opposite. There's nothing outside it. So you can't call it one, because one is an exclusive idea. It excludes two. So they call it, instead of one, they call it non-dual, which is advaita. This is from the word, you see, deva is the root meaning two. The V becomes U, so we get dual. And a is the meaning in Sanskrit often non. Non-dual, advaita. And so it, it doesn't exclude anything. One is an exclusive word. Advaita is meant to be a totally inclusive kind of unity. Now, of course, this word itself, when you look at it from a logical standpoint, is a dualistic word, just like one. It's the opposite of Dvaita, Dvaita and Advaita. But the idea here in Indian philosophy is to use this word in a certain way. Now, you know that on a flat surface, you can't draw three dimensions. Anything you draw will be in two dimensions. But why do we see three dimensions? Because of an artistic convention called one-pointed perspective, which will give you the illusion of a third dimension. Now, in other words, a two-dimensional line is being used to imply a third dimension which can never be expressed on a flat surface. So in exactly the same way, Advaita is a word used specially to designate what lies beyond all logical categories. So you have here a marvelous microcosm. You have a political and social analog of the manifestation and withdrawal of the worlds, of the Lord playing the game, or the self playing the game of being all of us, and then as each individual reaches moksha, the self realizes in terms of an individual life that it is the self. So exactly in this way, the child representing the self on the way in comes into this world plays around for a while <coughs> there are four castes just as there are four yugas to the kalpa cycle you remember and then out it goes back to the forest we would say back to nature but you see the outgoing stage of vanaprastha is a much higher state in the course of evolution than the hunting uh, society person who is primitive. He isn't simply going back to where he came from. He's spiraled. He's come round to an equivalent position but at a higher level and what he has gained in the interim is self-awareness. I mean that too in the ordinary sense when we speak of self-consciousness. See it's not much fun to be happy and not know it. We need a certain resonance. Self-consciousness is an echo in our heads. An echo of what we do, but wouldn't be aware of doing it if there wasn't an echo. When you see yourself in a mirror, the Vanaprastha then becomes again as a child. But then you see he has what Freud says the child has from the beginning. Freud called it the oceanic feeling. And the oceanic feeling is the sensation of being one with the universe. 
The Vanaprastha gets that back. But it's not a child's oceanic feeling. It's an adult's oceanic feeling. Something which the psychoanalysts don't discuss. Because according to them, all oceanic feelings are regressive. But if there is a mature oceanic feeling, as contrasted with the immature oceanic feeling of the child, which is as different as the oak is from the acorn. And so you can have this sensation, you see, of total unity with the cosmos, of the, shall I call it, expansion to infinity or contraction to infinity of your identity, without forgetting society's game rules with regard to you. In other words, it doesn't mean that you forget your address, telephone number, social security number, and the name you were given. You remember all that. And you can play that game when necessary. But you know it's a game. So, there is no way, as a matter of fact, of escaping from playing these games. And the only thing is that when you find out, you see, that you are thoroughly selfish, you inquire, what is it, what is the self that I love? What is this thing that I'm so interested in advancing and in protecting? And you look very closely in to what you feel when you think you feel yourself. And you know what you find out? That yourself is everything that you thought was someone else or something else. You have no knowledge of yourself, you see, except in relation to others. Self and other are as inseparable as back and front. There is no knowledge of self without the knowledge of otherness. There is no knowledge of the voluntary without the knowledge of the involuntary, of can without can't. So they go together. And that going together of self and other is non-duality, that's Advaita. That is the self with a capital S. So through self, one finds deliverance from self. We now come to the most complicated of all. The number four, marga. Marga in Sanskrit means path. And the Buddha taught an eightfold path for the realization of nirvana. This re always reminds me of a story about Dr. Suzuki, who, was a, who is a very, very great Buddhist scholar. And uh, many years ago, he was giving a fundamental lecture on Buddhism at the University of Hawaii. And he got to, he'd been going through these four truths, and he said, Ah, fourth noble truth is called a noble eightfold path. First step of a uh, noble eightfold path called a shoken. Shoken Japanese mean uh, right view. Aura Buddhism fundamentally is right view, right way of viewing this world. Second step of Noble Eightfold Path is, uh, oh, I forget second step, you look it up in the book. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I'm going to do rather the same thing. <laughs> what is important is this. The Eightfold Path has uh, really got three divisions in it. The first are concerned with understanding. The second division is concerned with conduct. And the third division is concerned with meditation. And every step in the path is preceded by the Sanskrit word samyak. 
in which sum is the key word. In Pali, summa. And so the first step, samyak drishti, which means, drishti means a view, a way of looking at things, a vision, an attitude, something like that. But this word samyak is in ordinary texts on Buddhism almost invariably translated right. This is a very bad translation. It does, of course, the word is used in certain contexts in Sanskrit to mean right, correct. But it has other and wider meanings. Sum means, like our word sum, which is derived from it, complete, total, all embracing. It also has the meaning of middle way. Uh, representing, as it were, the fulcrum, the center, the point of balance in a totality. Middle way way of looking at things. Middle way way of understanding the Dharma. Middle way way of speech, of conduct, of livelihood, and so on. Now, this is particularly cogent when it comes to Buddhist ideas of behavior. I was talking a great deal yesterday afternoon about the Buddhist attitude to change, to death, to the transience of the world, and was showing that preachers of all kinds stir people up in the beginning by alarming them about change. That's like somebody, you know, actually raising an alarm, uh, just in the same way as if I want to pay you a visit, I ring the doorbell. And then we can come in and I don't need to raise an alarm anymore. <laughs> so uh, in the same way, it sounds terrible, you see, that everything is going to die and pass away and uh, here you are, thinking that happiness, sanity and security consist in clinging on to things which can't be clung to and in, in any case there isn't anybody to cling to them. And the whole thing is a weaving of smoke. So that's the uh, initial standpoint but as soon as you really discover this and you stop clinging to change then everything is quite different. It becomes amazing. And not only do all your senses become more wide awake, not only do you feel almost that you're walking on air, but you see finally that there is no duality, no difference between the ordinary world and the nirvana world. They're the same world, but what makes the difference is the point of view. And of course, if you keep identifying yourself with some sort of stable entity that sits and watches the world go by, you don't acknowledge your union, your inseparability from everything else that there is. You go by with all the rest of the things, but if you insist on trying to take a permanent stand, on trying to be a permanent witness of the flux, then it grates against you and you feel very uncomfortable. But it is a fundamental feeling in most of us that we are such witnesses. We feel that behind the stream of our thoughts, of our feelings and our experiences, there is something which is the thinker, the feeler and the experiencer. 
not recognizing that that is itself a thought, feeling, or experience, and it belongs within and not outside the changing panorama of experience. It's what you call a cue signal. In other words, when you telephone and your telephone conversation is being tape recorded, it's uh, the law that there shall be a beep every so many seconds. And that beep cues you in to the f fact that this conversation is recorded. So in a very similar way, in our everyday experience, there's a beep which tells us this is a continuous experience, which is mine. Beep. <laughs> in the same way, for example, uh, it is a cue signal when a composer uh, arranges some music and he keeps in it a recurrent theme. But he makes many variations on it. Or more subtle still, he keeps within it a consistent style. So you know that it's Mozart all the way along, because it sounds like Mozart. But there isn't, as it were, a constant noise going all the way through to tell you it's continuous, although in Hindu music, they do have something called the drone. There is uh, behind all the drums and every kind of singing, something that goes and it always sounds the note which is the tonic of the scale being used. Uh, but in Hindu music, that drone represents the eternal self, the Brahman, behind all the changing forms of nature. But that's only a symbol. And to find out what is eternal, uh, you can't make an image of it, you can't hold on to it. And so it's psychologically more conducive to liberation to remember that the thinker or the feeler or the experiencer and the experiences are all together, they're all one. But if out of anxiety uh, you try to stabilize, keep permanent the separate observer, you are in for conflict.